Bless the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Let me leave my water over here. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 through to 7. And there it is up there on the screen. Praise God. Um, 2 Timothy 1, 6 to 7. And uh, let's just read together. It says, Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Hallelujah. Those are some good Bible promises we should remember. They know scriptures you should know as, as, uh, uh, um, for heart, you know, uh, because they're so important that it will come from time to time that Satan will try and attack you. And so I want to minister on this overcoming the spirit of fear today because it's a battle we are all going to face at some point in our Christian life. Now, again, you know, one way you'd know this is me and not a clone, being cloned by some evil aliens, is I'll always be using a boxing illustration. Amen. So anytime you hear me preach and I never mention a boxing illustration, it ain't me. It's an it's a, it's a, it's a evil clone. Amen. So um, most of us here have heard of Mike Tyson. Uh, but you may have never heard of the name Floyd Patterson, who was, a, who, who was a heavyweight champion way before Mike Tyson was. They actually came from the same ghetto area in New York, Bed Bedford Stuyvesant. Um, they both came from rough backgrounds, uh, uh, and they were both, at, in their times, the youngest heavyweight champions in the world. Floyd Patterson's world champion at 21, Mike Tyson beat him at the age of 20. Um, Floyd Patterson, when he grew up, like I said, he grew up dirt poor, and one thing he, he felt, even as a young boy, was as he saw his parents struggle, his dad would work as, as many hours as he could get, he would see his dad come home at, late at night, exhausted, just collapsing the sofa, too tired to eat, and he would take off his dad's shoes and put it beside him on that sofa. And one thing he kept seeing was just how poor they were, just how powerless he felt to actually make a difference. And it really impacted him, on, 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 on not just the poverty of having to do without, but the fact that he was powerless to help his parents. And, and I don't know what happened, but something got a hold of this young boy where he would oftentimes hide in dark alleys or he would find a dark room in a subway station and just close the door and spend hours in the total darkness. I mean, think about that. That's just weird behavior. Complete darkness for hours. Uh, fortunately for him, he discovered boxing at the age of, uh, well, as an early teen, about 13 or so, and he had the very same train as Mike Tyson, Customato. And Floyd Patterson became very good at it. You know, his brothers couldn't believe it because he was this cowardly kind of guy. But he became good. He became Olympic champion at 17. And he, four years later, became heavyweight champion of the world at 21. He actually became the first man to regain the heavyweight title, I think it was around 24 years at the time. And, and so uh, Floyd Patterson was a well-accomplished uh, a, 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 a sportsman, a well-accomplished boxer, but what, one of his fundamental flaws, or the fundamental flaw that overran his entire life was fear. One of the things he would do is, before every fight, he would pack a disguise kit, a false beard, an overcoat, and a hat, just in case he lost the fight. You know, and it wasn't that he feared being hurt, he feared losing. And the fear of it just had, you know, just in case, and every fight I have this bag with my disguise kit. Imagine, imagine living like that. And so, after he regained the heavyweight title for the second time, he was invited by John F. Kennedy, the President of the United States, to visit the White House. And normally when, the, when a, a heavyweight champion goes to meet the president, the president will just, you know, general chit-chat, generic questions like who you fight next and good luck on your next opponent. But at this time, the number one contender was a man named Sonny Liston who was like the uh, a 60s version of Mike Tyson, knocking everyone out everywhere. But you've got to remember this was the height of the black civil rights movement. And Liston was a thug. 
and a ex-con and the black the, the you know like the NAACP all of the big wig black people did not want a man like that to be heavyweight champion because he would represent black people in a bad way and JFK was very much a part of the civil rights movement and so at this meeting with Patterson JFK said he said listen Floyd you've got to not you got to beat this guy there is no way this man should become heavyweight champion of the world and, and here is what Floyd Patterson replied. He says, uh, I felt all alone there, completely terrified. You've got to remember how young I was, what my background was, and now I was getting advice in the Oval Office. What was I supposed to do? Disagree? I had to take the challenge. I was always afraid of letting people down, and now I was in a position where I had to worry about letting down the president. You know, because up until now, he's been fearing Liston. Liston has been knocking everybody out, and Patterson did not want to fight him. And there was all kinds of excuses that his trainer, his manager, would give, oh, he's been connected to the mafia, is this and that. But now the president has given him a mandate. You've got to beat this guy, and it scared him stiff. And so they eventually fought, and at the stare down, Patterson, I mean, uh, Liston looked at Mad Dog them, you know, his evil eyes, uh, but Patterson looked at his shoe. And the fight lasted two minutes, six seconds of the first round. And Liston wiped the floor with this boy. And you know what happened right afterwards? Right afterwards, he waited for the stadium to clear. He put on his disguise kit. He went to the airport to find the next flight of the country, literally. He found a flight to Madrid. That was the next flight. Got on it, went to Madrid, checked into a hotel, acting like an old man, and stayed in his hotel room for the, at most of his meals there. He went, you know, walked like an old man with a limp. He only went out to one restaurant once, and he ordered soup because that's what he thought old people eat, you know? And, and he said that, you know, the people in Madrid thought this guy's some weird old guy. And... And he said this in his book. His book was called Victory Over Myself. He said, you must wonder what makes a man do the things like this. Well, I wonder too. And the answer is I don't know. But I think that there is a certain weakness in me. Within every human being, there is a certain weakness. It is a weakness that exposes itself more when you're alone. And I've figured out that part of the reason I do the things that I do and cannot seem to conquer that one word myself is because... I am a coward. Now think with me for a moment. This man was an Olympic champion at 17. Any 17-year-old Olympic gold medalist here? <laughs> Amen. This man was world champion at 21 and again at 24. The first man to regain the heavyweight title. The first man to fight for the heavyweight title three times. This man was a very accomplished man. You know, and yet for all of that, he could not shake one thing. A fundamental fear that arises whenever there was a major challenge. You know, like I said, this man accomplished things. But in the background, one of those apps working in the back of his mind is this fear factor. And yes, he could achieve. But when certain situations arose, fear got a hold of him. And he began to do irrational and crazy things. And so I want to talk about fear today, church, because the truth is uh, there are people I've seen in the church over the years, normal people, and for the most part doing okay. But every now and again, they will make mad decisions that's out of character. They become irrational. They'll do insane, crazy things. Uh, and at the root of it, many times, is this issue of fear. And so again, we look at our text, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of self-control, or a sound mind. Now, you know, the word fear in our text, you know, the, you know, every time you hear the word fear, you hear the word phobos, or phobos, or, you know, phobia. And, and that's not the definition in this word. This word is only found one time in the Bible, in the original Greek. And it's a word that is named dahlia, and it, it means a trait wherein excessive fear prevents a person from taking a risk or facing danger. And so the point here is simply this, that there are times as a Christian, a challenge will be staring you in the face. There is a situation, there is a mountain to climb, there is a challenge to overcome, there is a situation in which uh, you need to give yourself to, and it is at this moment in time, this intense spirit 
of fear gets a hold of you, and rather than you go forward, you go backward. Rather than you go ahead and achieve things, uh, you, you know, you just give up everything uh, and you lose that at the end of the day. Because the truth is, church, the promises of God are given to us, not as a mantra to repeat over and over again, as some Christians do, um, but to say, you know what, this is for you, but for you to get it, you have to rise up. You have to claim the promises of God. Many times you have to battle through demonic strongholds uh, and demonic strategies. Uh, you've got to have to fight to gain the promises of God. Isn't this what God told the children of Israel? For 400 years, God told Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the land is yours to you and your descendants. Uh, but when they went in, uh, it wasn't easy. You know, they didn't go in and there was uh, jacuzzis and uh, everything. You know, they, there was giants in the land. And you remember what happened is that the people now, when they saw it, uh, they said, you know what? Hey, we ain't going in. And what happened? They lost out. Because the promises of God require people to rise up. The kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. And so if you think you can lie down in your bed eating crisp and drinking Coke, Amen. you can forget it. Amen. It's not going to happen. You're going to be wasting your time for the, and you're going to say, oh, God ain't real, or oh, God ain't got no power. No, that's nothing to do with that. You know, it, the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 23, 31, verse 23, it says, He inaugurated Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, Be strong and of good courage, for you shall bring the children of Israel into the land which I swore to them, and I will be with you. Now, this is 40 years after the initial experience of not stepping into the promises of God. God raised up Joshua and five times in the book of Deuteronomy and Joshua, God says to Joshua, be strong and of good courage. Because for you to get what I have for you, you better have some courage. You better be strong. And God repeats it again and again and again and again because that Joshua, like anybody else, can succumb to that spirit of fear and stay right at the border, right on the threshold of all that God has for them. God has not given us a spirit of fear today. You know, we're not living in a time in world history, especially in Western society, where there's never been as much uncertainty as there is now. Everybody was living life and everything was fine and happy until January 2020 when we hear of some virus from Wuhan. Amen. And that just knocked everybody's life upside down. And we know that to this day there's some people ain't returned to church. You know what I'm saying? Everything when I, and people are fearful. I don't know if I'm going to get it. I don't know if I get it, if I will survive. I don't know if my loved ones, if they get it, they're going to survive. What about my grandma? What about my uncle, elderly, my sick uncle? Whoa. And fear started to grip people in a way that has not been seen since World War II. Then right after that, we have uh, Uncle Vlad invading the Ukraine. And then all of a sudden, people are wondering, man, if that madman would invade us as well. You know what I'm saying? And so there's all kinds of things going on right now. And we're living in a time and a generation uh, where people are so fearful. Petrol prices gone through the roof. I was with Pastor Leo yesterday. I said, can't be one pound 75p. My, where's the petrol going? You know, I can't remember the good old days. I remember when it was 69p. Anyone remember? I remember, man. You know, hey, who would have ever thought you see things like this going on? You know, people are wondering, they say we're on the verge of a recession. People are panicking. People have fear for their lives. They talk about the fact that uh, 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 conditions like anorexia is up. Mental health issues is up. People are suffering from all kinds of issues uh, that they were not or accelerated uh, that it was three years ago. Fear. Amen. Amen. I was reading, you know, there's a advert, uh, you know, one of these agony aunts. Uh, I mentioned one this morning, but... In America, there was a very popular one called Ann Landers. You may not have known her, but I can remember reading magazines with her when I was a kid. And, and she was an advice columnist for over 30 years. She received, at her peak, 10,000 letters a day. People looking for advice. 
She said the one topic that dominated over than any other topic wasn't money, wasn't kids, wasn't marriage, wasn't finance. The number one topic in all of those letters was fear. Now, this was back in the 80s. Now, imagine how much more now today. Fear amplified. Amen. Um, and many people are fearful of what does the future hold for me, for my children. People are freaking out about climate change. Uh, will this world be around 50 years from now? Greta is making everybody scared. You've stolen my future, she says. And, and people are tripping. There's extinct rebellion. And there's uh, these um, knuckleheads who are, who are trying to insulate Britain. And, and all of these people, man. You know, everybody's fearful of something. Hmm. You know, Jesus did say in the last days that one of the themes of life is going to be fear. Now, we're not living in this exact scripture yet. This is speaking about the tribulation. And Jesus said in Luke 21, 26, men's hearts failing them for fear and expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. And we can see uh, a prelude to this happening right now. That fear is something that is accelerating in this world today people more and more are anxious uh, they're depressed uh, they're fearful uh, and all kinds of vibes that they're going through their system uh, and you know one of the reasons why entertainment is so big is people are trying to escape even for a little bit the fears that they have amen hmm you know the truth is church you know one of the things, I, I don't even want, I used to watch the news all the time. You know, I had to cut it down. Because everything, you know, and part of it is that fear sells, you know. You want views, put something on that's fearful. You know what I'm saying? Something shocking, outrageous. Uh, and I have to say, you know what, for, for my sake, man, I've got to cut it down. Because it's, if it's a one thing, it's another. If it ain't, if it ain't a, 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 a COVID, uh, then it's the assassination in Haiti. Then the Afghanistan invasion, um, the Taliban. And then you know, now there's monkeypox and there's this and there's that. And if you listen to the news long enough, man, um, you won't even step out your house, the door of your house. Say, man. And so I say this today, church, because uh, fear is something that is very much real. And if you're not careful, it's something that is going to grip you. I remember when Wolves came to an impact team in Jamaica. And I remember Nikela, you know, uh, 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 Nicole's sister came and uh, she checked into her hotel room and there was a lizard there. And she freaked out. But now that she's freaking out, she's checking everywhere for spiders, for lizards, for creepy crawlies. Because uh, fear amplifies. You know what I mean? Before that, she was fine. But now she sees one lizard, it's like the whole place is covered. We get us human nature. You know, that fear, once, we get, once fear gets you, you know, fear will amplify if you're not careful. And as Christian people, we got to understand something. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Amen. So, Spears, you know, I don't want to just say this. A spirit of fear and fear are two different things. Fear is a normal reaction to things. Hey, listen, I, I remember when I was in Jamaica, I remember my aunt telling me that my granddad used to be scared of lightning. I'm thinking, what big man like that scared of lightning? You know what I'm saying? I kind of, you know, kind of diminished my granddad in my eyes a little bit. <laughs> Till I experienced a Jamaican uh, 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 lightning storm. Hey, let me tell you something. You see, in England, you see lightning in the distance, and it looks so beautiful, so majestic, so glorious, the wonders of the Lord. Amen. You go in Jamaica, man, you're afraid for your life. I, listen, I've been through some. I remember one. Listen, I've heard lightning. I'm not talking about hearing thunder. I've heard lightning. I remember I was with Kejo, my first disciple, and uh, we're walking somewhere, man, and the whole place, lightning is, I mean, lightning is going off. Bis you know, normally you hear lightning anyway, 10 seconds in the year. Listen, this was instant. Boom! And I remember one man where he went, vist. You heard it. I'm like, my, the hairs on the back of my head stood up, man. And we had to, we ran into Tacey's, the patty shopper. And as soon as we ran in one, and bam! And Kedja went, oh! You know, hey, I remember going through one and, uh, and I had to, listen, I didn't want to touch the side of my cars, man. It was, it was going everywhere. Listen, hey, but that's normal fear because when the sun comes out, it's not, you're back to cool, you're good now. You know what I'm saying? You know, and there's certain fears that are like that. You know, the son of a gunshot, bam. You know, then most of the time you come back to, you, know, you should come back to normal. 
But then you have this fear that never leaves you. It's like a fog that covers your mind wherever you go. It follows you to bed at night. And it's the first thing to greet you when you wake up in the morning. It torments in your dreams. Amen. Uh, fear, fear. This is a different thing because you can't shake it no matter what you do. It is a spirit of fear. Let me tell you something, church. This spirit is looking for an access point. Amen. And if you give the, you open a door to this spirit, it is going to come in and it's going to torment you. Amen. One of the ways in which you open this door is by not having dominion in your spiritual life. I remember as a new Christian, not, not new, I've been married, I was married, just recently married to Cheryl, so I'd have been saved uh, three years or so, maybe just under four. And I remember there was this guy we were working with, a guy named Paul Jones. He was, uh, he was a guy from Liverpool but moved to London, he had married her. And uh, he's, you know, living a normal life. He's like one of the multi tradesmen Did it, doing well for himself, uh, only to discover that his wife was cheating on him. While she was pregnant and she aborted his child, kicked him out of the house that they bought together and, uh, and moved in with this, this guy. Paul was a guy enraged by this because now he's living in a council flat in one of the worst areas in Brixton. The Scouser guy. You know, and you know, let me tell you the thing about Paul. Paul was a great guy. I mean, nice guy. He'd give you the clothes off his back, but he hated his ex-wife. This guy was bound by the spirit of unforgiveness. And I tell you what, man, when he got drunk, he, this, I've never seen anything like it. Normal drunk people would be staggering and blah, blah. Paul was, looked sober. His eyes are clear. He could walk a straight line, but it weren't him. It weren't him. And this guy got banned from every pub in Brixton and, and, and Stockwell. He got banned from everyone. And I remember, you know, he'd come to church and, and, you know, he just would not forgive his wife. And uh, I remember one occasion he found this girl, this job, gave her an interview. So let's say the interview is at 11 o'clock. He rings her at 10 o'clock. It's like she ain't got time to get there in an hour. He sees her at church that evening and he just goes for it you know rebuking her because he had this issue against women i, I said no, no hey you can't be doing this so he, he stopped coming to church but let me tell you what he'd come to my flat late at night when he was drunk and he would knock on the door at three in the morning and let me tell you this when paul spoke it wasn't one person talking at the same time paul said jay I'm going to kill you. Now, one person said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when 10 people say it at the same time, so, let me tell you what, man, I have never been so spooked in all of my life. If I was so spooked, I could feel the hair on my skin rubbing against the clothes. That's how, and I'll tell you what, man, for weeks, I was terrified. You know, what happened just shortly after that, he actually got run over by a, a bus in, um, in Brixton. And Courtney Lowe and I went to hospital to see him. His head is big as a balloon. He died, unfortunately. But even when I saw him in the hospital, I was I'm like, why am I so afraid? Because it was a spirit. Are you with me? But I failed to exercise dominion. I bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. Should I go to do and shanda ba korobo see and die? But I'm under the sheep. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Another way in which fear can get a hold of you is through rejection. And I've seen people, people like I talk under the surface, look well put together, but their number one fear is being left alone. Their number one fear is no one will care for them. Their number, and so they're willing to make all kind of mad decisions, do all kind of mad stuff, because they are fearful of being left alone. Another access point is trauma. That something tr traumatic occurred in your life. And as a result of that, you are forever bound by that incident. I know one sister who had, was in a bad car accident as a young person and ever since then that kind of marked her life 
that when she did her driving test, she failed and failed and failed. And it's like one, you know, fear. Fear I'm going to die in a car accident. I remember when I was in Jamaica, we had a, a neighbor, a good couple. They, they, you know, a West Indian guy married to an English woman and a uh, Scottish woman, I think. And uh, they had moved to, back to Jamaica. And, uh, but he went into it because he's an overseas, what they call a returnee. And they know, when they look at you, they know you're, 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 you're not from here, are you? So he was in Mandeville Town Center and got held up with a gun right in the middle of town. Ever since then, that was 10 years before we met him, never been back in. Now I'm there every day. I'm up and down. I'm shopping. I'm outreaching. I'm doing all these kind of things. Uh, nothing has ever happened to me but him. He'll never go back there again. Fear. Amen. Fear could be by the people you associate with. The people you're linked with can impart fear from you into, from them into you. Here's the Bible, number 30, 13, 33. This is, again, the, the scouts that went to the promised land, saw the giants, freaked out, and came back. The Bible says, there, was, there we saw giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And so the Bible says, fear jumped from these ten men into the entire nation, because fear is infectious you know when i pioneered in manchester the conference i got sent out there was a few guys who got sent out at the same time as me and i remember striking up a friendship with one of these guys he was from a different fellowship church and because we're both going out at the same time you know trying to uh, pioneer and do something for god together and now and again, I think once a month we'd talk and just catch up how things are going, how things with you, what can I pray for, you know. You know and, 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 but every month we would talk and he would tell me, oh, there's this doom that's going on in this town. They were hurt, man, this, the outreach went bad. Oh, my, you know, our service, we didn't have anyone today. And, and that's all he's saying, man. And I'm going to tell you, every time I hung up the phone, this cold wave of fear would just come over me. What if I don't have breakthrough in Manchester? What if nobody really what if nobody really gets saved? What if no one gets and, and every time and I was you know, and now as an older pastor, you know, I, I can listen to a call like that and, and go to bed and no big deal. But then this is my first church. I have no reference points of breakthrough and all that kind of stuff in my own life. And I just felt fearful to the point where you know what I had to do? Cut him off. Every time he rang, I never answered the phone. I did not ring him. When he rang me, I did not answer. Until eventually he stopped ringing and I stopped talking. <laughs> and the sad thing is he eventually went back in because he couldn't hack it out there. But it was fear. Fear can pass from one person to the next. Are you hearing? Fear will traffic through words. That's the vehicle in which it passes from one person to the next. And you've got to understand, you've got to be very careful, church, that fear doesn't get a hold of your heart. Ignorance could be another way. Remember, you know, you know, racism and xenophobia are ignorance. When people fear other people, they fear people they do not know. They don't know their culture, they don't know their background, but fear gets a hold of people's hearts. You know, I remember when this whole COVID thing first started and no one had a clue what was going on. Is this from some wet market in China? Is this a, a genetically uh, modified virus? Uh, what the heck is this? Uh, how are we going to, you know, how does it kill people? What, what? And everyone was panicking. Uh, and I remember, you know, one of the first countries to really be hit was Iraq. Not Iraq, Iran. And, um, you know, they got hit really hard in the early days, along with China and Italy. I think they were the big three at the time. And uh, they heard that alcohol kills the virus. Now, it's true, if you rub, if there's a surface with, with um, COVID and you put alcohol in it, you know, it's, it'll kill it. You know, a lot of the hand wa wash that we had and, you know, it, there's alcohol and it kill the virus. But it don't mean if you drink alcohol, <laughs> it's going to cure the virus. And this is an Islamic country. So alcohol is not something you find around the, the corner. You know what I'm saying? And on top of that, alcohol is a whole variance of, of, of chemicals. You have methanol, you got the butanol, you got ethanol is the one we drink. But these people didn't know anything better. They heard, oh, this is industrial alcohol. It's methanol. It can make you blind or it can kill you. And it kills 73 people. These people are trying to save themselves from COVID, end up dying from alcohol poisoning because of ignorance. I'm telling you, church, uh, fear 
finds its way into ignorant people's lives. I've seen Christian people out of fear make bad, irrational choices. Fear I'm not going to get married. Fear I'm going to be left on a shelf. Uh, fear that, uh, 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 that I may never find a perfect job. Uh, fear and they start doing some madness. Make bad choices, meet the wrong people, take the wrong career mover out of fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear. You know, the thing about fear today, church, is that it's a tormenting spirit. Believe me, I know what it's like. I know what it's like to be tormented by the spirit of fear. You know, when I was a new convert, I was probably saved Less than two months. I can't remember the date. December 28, 1992. I thought I blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Boy, that sent me on a five-month roller coaster, man, where I thought I was losing my mind. Because I thought I was going to hell. I actually thought God and Satan was conspiring to get me to hell. You know what I'm saying? That's how twisted it was. But I can remember every time I read the book of Psalms and it says something mad, you know, like, yeah, destroy them, Lord. You know what I'm saying? I'm freaking out. I'd, I'd go to bed at night. I'm dreaming about hell. I'm telling you, listen, it was so bad. Listen how irrational fear is. That, I, that day, the 28th of December, I left my flat for a month. The rice was on the stove that I just cooked. It went green when I came back. The fridge, you open it up and all kind of, <laughs> the milk had gone off, things that was pouring out. The fridge was nasty. I quit my job because I couldn't go into work. That's how much it got me. You, you, you know, it's how irrational it is. I, and if you had seen me at that age of 20 acting like that, you think this brother has mental issues. <laughs> and I guess I did. But it was a spirit. Are you with me? Tormenting my mind uh, all that I did, amen. So when you're tormented, you're not going to have joy. You're not going to, definitely ain't going to have any peace, amen. Uh, and I'm telling you, church, there are people like that, tormented, tormented that uh, the devil is going to reveal the past sins. Tormented that people may find out where I've been in life and who I really am, or so you think, amen. Uh, and so as a result, some people never step out. They just want to stay in this little box, because I don't want to step out. Some people fear the devil, feeling that somehow if I step out, then the devil is just going to expose me. The devil is going to make life difficult for me. And now you live in a prison of your own making. Romans 8.15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Do you see again, church, there's a spirit of bondage. And there's a spirit of adoption today. And as Christians, uh, God has not given us a spirit of bondage again to fear. But a spirit of adoption. And that is a very powerful thing today, church. Uh, because many times people are bound, like I said before, there's some people who haven't even left their house. They're getting um, uh, Sainsbury's to deliver their shopping. Working from home because they're going to try and minimize as much contact with the out outside world. We're only going to come out when COVID disappears. Well, guess what? It's going to be here like the cold and the flu forever. Amen. And, uh, and, and, and people live in bondage, church. See, Paul writes to Timothy to stir up the gift of God in him by the laying out of hands. And then he says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. Why does he say that? Because Timothy, for all of his attributes, is afraid to step out and operate in the gifts and calling that God has given him. That's why Paul's right. And this is the second time. You read 1 Timothy. Paul says the same thing. Uh, he says, use the gifts of God that is in you. Through the laying on of my hands. And now again, Paul reminds him all over again. Because Paul knows that while Timothy is a pastor and he's doing all this stuff. There is a spirit stopping him from being his best. You can function as a Christian. And you can be competent in some things, but you won't be the person God wants you to be or have the full expression of all that God has for you if you allow the spirit to rule and to dominate your thinking. Amen. I see Christians who are fearful of stepping out for fear of being hurt. And one thing I learned in, in life, if you fear being hurt and you don't step out, a worse hurt is going to come on you because you did not step out. 
you know, Muhammad Ali's easiest fight was a British guy named Brian London. And it took place in London, Earl's Court. Easy third round knockout. Uh, it's one of those, um, you, if you go on, ever see a, a documentary or anything on Muhammad Ali, you'll always see this one fight where Muhammad Ali knocks this guy out with a 12 punch combo. Fast as lightning. It's beautiful. And Ali was at his best. He was 24. He, he, was, he used all of his advantages his youth, his speed, his uh, athleticism, his height, his weight. Uh, and he beat uh, Brian London like he owned him. And Brian said this. He said, Ali was big, fast, and he could punch. Where I was, I was smaller, fatter, and couldn't punch. He stopped me in three rounds, and that was it. I don't think I hit him. It was good money, and I got well paid for it. That's all I fought for. But he said this, every fight I ever had, I always had a goal. But with Muhammad Ali, I thought, don't get hurt, Brian. And <laughs> therefore, I didn't try, which was wrong, totally wrong. By you being afraid of getting hurt, boy, you got the beating of your life. Because, hey, I, I know it's Ali, but at least have a go. Amen. And you don't have a go, it makes it worse. You know, and, and, and I say this, church, because some of us, man, we don't want to step out. Because I'm afraid what happened to me in the past may happen to me again and worse. And let me tell you something, it will. That which I fear the most has come upon me. Is that what Job said? Because when you allow fear to dominate your life, the very thing you're hiding from comes for you. So I want to move on today, church, and look at three things from our text. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he has given us a spirit of a sound mind. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, the, the amazing thing here is that we think of the mind and the spirit as two different things. But here we see the spirit of God, the spirit of adoption, is what helps you to have a sound mind. The word sound mind is the word for neo. So for neo, which means, uh, it comes from two words. So, so which means a saved or delivered and protected. And for neo, which is a total frame of thinking. And so the word so for neo means uh, that uh, a mind that has been rescued and salvaged and is now safe and secure. That's what the Spirit of God does. When you get saved from your sin, God takes your mind and he salvages it from the madness of the world and it's now safe and secure. That's if you allow the Spirit of God to do that. Amen. And that is the great thing about being a Christian is while the whole world may seem to be losing their mind, you have your wits about you. If you're walking in the spirit of God, while everyone is ah and freaking out, you have your mind together. One of the things or one of the stages of Christian maturity is you moving from freaking out to someone in control of your mind. That you don't allow your mind to go all over the place. When your mind is full of anxiety and fear, it's because you've allowed your mind to unravel. You need to Get your mind together. The Bible says in 1 Peter, gird up the loins of your mind. You ever read that scripture? What does that mean? In back in the days, people wore robes. And if you had to run, you have to gather up the robes together in one and then run. You could just run in robes. You trip over the cloth. So you have to gather it up. And so Paul is, uh, Peter is, in that verse says, you've got to gather your mind. You can gather your mind. And I'm not here to say that every mental collapse is, uh, is, uh, is, 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 it can be overcome. But I've met people in life who have fallen, gone through some kind of psychological episode and it's because they have allowed their mind to just completely unravel. God has not given you the spirit of fear. He has given you the spirit of a sound mind. Get your mind back together. Let the world freak out. Let people lose the plot. Let them have anxiety and all that kind of stuff. That is not your portion today. And it's a great testimony that when everyone is losing your heads, uh, you're not. Because people look to you and say, how are you so collected? How are you so put together? Can you not see what is going on? And you can say, yes, I see exactly what you see. But I serve a God in heaven who said, God has not given me a spirit of fear. I'm not talking a pep talk today, church. I'm talking a practical reality. People are talking about protecting their mental health. 
God has not given us a spirit of fear. That's where it starts. Amen. But a spirit of power. God will never call you to a task and not empower you. And that's what Paul is trying to get through to Timothy. Stir up the gifts. Why? Because God has given you a spirit of power. Because Timothy at this point is thinking, yes, I know what God is calling me to do. I just don't know if I could do it. And that is true, Timothy. You can't. But guess what? God has given you the spirit of power. Because if God has called you and God has equipped you, God will give you the power to do it. Amen. I don't know why Chris, oh, I can't sing. But sis, I heard your voice, man. You sing like an angel. But I'm afraid. Yeah, God has not given you a spirit of fear. Amen. There's so many people are sitting down and anointing, sitting down on gifts because you're afraid. What if I fail? What if people laugh at me? So what if you fail? What if people laugh? You know what's worse is coming to the end of your life and realizing you've not done what God has called you to do. Because I can tell you this, those people who laughed at you, they're not thinking about you anymore. Why you have them on your mind? People laugh at you, they're not going to go to bed at night thinking, you know, <laughs> that person tried to do something for God. They're not thinking about you. Why are you letting people live in your mind rent free? Are you hear me today? Listen, you may fail, but you will get back up and you'll be better the next time around. You know, I remember when I first pioneered, uh, this woman in, that came to a couple services, she dropped a letter through my letterbox saying, listen, you're not called to preach. You can't preach to save your life. <laughs> and it was true. I couldn't preach then. <laughs> but I can't listen to people. Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, Pastor Carnegie, this woman wrote this to me. I think I'm going to go back home. Yeah. You, 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 you can't do that. You, you, you know what I mean? I'm going to tell you, you know, <laughs> you know, the good old story back in the day, um, Pastor uh, um, uh, Dimitri, who leads the praise and worship in South London. You know, Pastor Stevens, one time he, was, he stopped rapping and he tried to sing, and, and he, went, he went off key, man, a couple of times. And Pastor Stevens said, listen, you know what? Stick to rapping, you can't sing. <laughs> But Dimitri is one of the best praise and worship leaders in our fellowship. And the, 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 the reality is, church, that sometimes you will fail. Yeah. Yeah. But God has not given you the spirit of fear. Yeah. What you need to learn is experience. Yeah. Because you get better and better. No one starts anything perfect. Yeah. Everyone has to start at some point. Yeah. Amen. The other thing, church, is this. God is going to give you the power to do it. You know, when, you know, Pastor Lynn's been to Mandeville, and uh, going to Mandeville is a hill called Spur Tree Hill. It's one of the worst roads in Jamaica for accidents because people fly off that mountain like uh, it's no big deal, and the cars end up in ditches. Let me tell you, man, you see some cars just wrecked right before you. Madness. Cars crashing into houses. Insane. But going up that hill, you'll see a lot of cars just pull over to the side of the road. The engine just, pow, broke down. But you'll see some of these big, huge trucks carrying monumental weight on the back. And it's, and it's going about 10 miles an hour. But they're going up that hill slow but sure. Let me tell you, the engine in that truck isn't a scooter engine. It's not a bike engine. It's an engine equipped to carry that load over the hill. God has given you such an engine. God has not said your scooter engine is going to do his will. Because then you could be fearful. God says, I have this big old engine to help you. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power today. Do you believe it? That's the thing. Because a lot of times we're like, my goodness, look at me. Yes, I know you're small, but we serve a great God today. The other thing as we close is that God has given us a spirit of love. Spirit of love, spirit of adoption. That God loved us. That he chose us in spite of who we are. You know you love the children you bring into this world. You know you love your kids. But loving someone that was, was, was not your own biologically. Hey, that's a powerful love in it of itself. That you choose to love someone you did not have to. Amen. That's the love of God. 
the Bible says is a spirit of love. Amen. And many times uh, we tend to forget that God is love. We think God is mad at us for making mistakes. God wants to judge us. God wants to do all kind of mad things. Uh, but God is love. And the Holy Spirit is a spirit of love today. Or oh, the spirit of love. First John 4, 18. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. How did he love us? On the cross. He died on the cross for our sin. Regardless of who you are today, God loves you. How does he know? By he dying on the cross for your sin. And so fear, church, the Bible says, perfect love casts out fear. Perfect or mature or complete love. And if you are living in fear today, it's because you don't truly understand the love of God. Because the spirit of love lives in you. Hallelujah today. Amen. And that is why we have got to have an understanding of the cross of Jesus. Because at the end of the day, the root of the spirit of fear is simply this, sin. Genesis 3, 9, the Lord God called to Adam and said, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. The first thing to happen when sin was fear. Right there, fear came in. And the cross of Jesus is the cross that neutralizes the power of sin, and therefore the spirit of fear has no legal right in your life. If sin is in your, if, if fear is in your life, it's there illegally because you're ignorant. Amen. You know, America has a holiday called Juneteenth. Don't know if anyone heard about it. It's really June the 19th. And that, that was the day. And, and let me backtrack. The, the, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 in America, the Republican Party was formed to get rid of slavery because uh, the party that was against, was pro-slavery was the Democrats. They formed the Ku Klux Klan and all that stuff. Uh, and so the Democratic Party was formed and Abraham Lincoln became president. And the South, who were Democrats, did not like this, and so they broke off and it became a civil war. Now, in the middle of the Civil War, I believe it was the 1st of January, 1863, Abraham Lincoln proclaimed all slaves in America free. Now, the thing is, though, in the South, they never respected those laws. So a lot of black people were still in slavery. But after the war was won in 1865, there were still a lot of black people, especially in Texas, that were still living in slavery, though they were free. And so Lincoln had to send uh, soldiers to Texas. And on June 19, the proclamation was made. You guys have been free. You've been free for time. You just did not know it. Are you hearing me today, church? And I say that because the truth is uh, that God has set all of us free today. Don't allow ignorance to allow... There was maybe a time where the spirit of fear had a legal right in your life. But now that you're saved and born again, it has no legal authority over you. Is You have allowed it to stay as an illegal squatter. And you as a landlord of your life has been given the authority of God to cast it out. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Can I have everybody, every eyes closed over this room today?